Hello and welcome back to the Westbound Mass channel. My name is Jenny. In today's video, we're going to look at three past paper questions on moments, which is quite a heavyweight topic under the A-level Applied Mass Mechanics syllabus. Before we look at the questions, I want to quickly recap some of the key concepts in this topic. The first one is the distinction between a particle and a rigid body. We dealt with particles quite a lot in the previous lecture courses. If you haven't seen that, I will put the link up above for you to check out. Particles are objects that have no dimensions. When I apply a force to a particle, it will start to accelerate in the same direction of my original force. What it means that if I have a particle and I apply a horizontal force F to it, this particle will start to accelerate horizontally to the right and it will never go off track. It won't go like this, it won't go like that because this particle has no dimension. This is not the case with rigid bodies. Rigid bodies are objects with dimensions. When I apply a force to it, not only can I move it, I might also be able to turn it around. The most common example of a rigid body in A-level mass is a seesaw or a beam resting on a fixed point. Let's consider a seesaw which is resting on this wedge, I'm going to call it point A. So now comes a person who's going to sit on one end of the seesaw. We all know what's going to happen. The seesaw is going to rotate clockwise, and now it's going to look something like this. So what happened here? Well, this person has a weight, W, and when this weight W is applied to the rigid body, which is the beam in this case, it turned it around its fixed point A. So now moments measures precisely that turning effect of a force when it's applied to a rigid body. And moment is equal to the magnitude of the force multiplied by the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to the force. What does that mean? What is the axis of rotation? Well, consider our seesaw again. It can rotate either clockwise or anti-clockwise in this two-dimensional plane. The axis of rotation is actually the third dimension. You can think about it as this line going into the screen across my fixed point A. So coming back to my xy two-dimensional plane, the axis of rotation is simply the fixed point of my rigid body, which is A. To find the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation, I simply need to draw a line from point A such that it is perpendicular to the direction of the force. In our case, the weight is pointing vertically downwards. And the distance of this line is what we're looking for. So now we have seen the definition of moments, we need to quickly update our definition or the condition of a object in equilibrium. In the forces lecture, we said that in order for a particle to be in equilibrium, it needs to meet two conditions. The first one is that there is zero net force applied on the particle in any given direction. The second condition is that the particle needs to be moving with zero acceleration, meaning that it is either stationary or it is moving with a constant velocity. Now that we have introduced the turning effect forces can have on rigid body. So for a rigid body to be in equilibrium, it also needs to have zero moments, which has a unit of Newton meter in any direction, either clockwise or anti-clockwise. So now we have seen the key definition or key concepts of moments. Let's jump into the first question. Question one was taken from the AQA sample paper two, question 11. It says that a uniform rod AB has length three meters and mass 24 G. A particle of mass MKG is attached to the rod at A. The rod is balanced in equilibrium on a support at C, which is 0 0.8 meters from A. Find the value of M. Similar as before in the forces lecture, I always like to take the information the question has given me in a force diagram first. So the question told us that we're working with a uniform rod. That is important because it tells me the weight of the rod is pointing vertically downwards from the midpoint 
of this rod. So this is equal to 1.5 meter. It also tells me a particle of mass m is attached to the rod at A. So here I have weight of the particle, which is equal to mg. The rod is balanced in equilibrium on a support at C. Newton's third law of motion tells me for any action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. I'm going to call this natural reaction R. We know that it is always perpendicular to the contact surface. Because this rod is balanced in equilibrium, we know that it meets all of the three conditions of any rigid body in equilibrium. That is, there is zero net force in any direction. And there is zero acceleration. In our case, the rigid body or the rod is stationary. Third condition is that there is zero moment, either clockwise or anti-clockwise, i.e. all of the three forces collectively, collectively have zero turning effect of this rod. It is asking us to find the value of m. Well, using the third condition, which is zero net turning effect of any of these forces, on my rod, I'm going to find the value of m. How do I do that? Well, I can take moments at my fixed point C. That way, I no longer need to consider the turning effect of the natural reaction force R. Why is that the case? Well, because there is no distance from this force to my axis of rotation, i.e. the perpendicular distance between this force R to my axis of rotation, which is simply point C in this two-dimensional plane, is zero. Okay? Now looking at these two weights, the weight of the particle is going to have a anti-clockwise turning effect on my rod. However, the weight of the rod will have a clockwise turning effect on my rod around the fixed point C. And these two will cancel each other out, giving me zero net moment. Let's go ahead and do that. The moment of the weight of the particle is equal to WP multiplied by the perpendicular distance to the axis of rotation C is this one. That is equal to 0 0.8 given to us by the question. And this is equal to WR, the weight of the rod, multiplied by this perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation. That is simply equal to 1.5 minus 0 0.8. As you can see, we took moments at C, and from there on, I can work out that my m, which is the mass of the particle, is equal to 21 kilogram. Question 2 was taken from the Ad Excel 2015 M1 paper, question 5. It says that a beam AB has length 5 meter and mass 25 kg. The beam is suspended in equilibrium in a horizontal position by two vertical ropes. Let's draw out the force diagram. So say I have a ceiling where my rod AB is suspended from. Question tells us that wrong rope is attached to the beam at A. Here I have one rope. I have tension TA exerted by the rope um, to this beam. And the other rope is attached to the point C on the beam. We see here where CB is equal to 0 0.5 meter. Here is my other rope, and it's exerting a tension TC to the beam or the rod. Question also tells us that a particle P of mass 60 kilogram is attached to the beam at B. We know that the weight of the particle is equal to 60 G. And the beam remains in equilibrium in a horizontal position. The beam is modeled as a uniform rod. This tells me that the weight of the rod, WR, which is equal to 25G, given to us by the question, is exerting vertically downwards from the midpoint of this rod, as this length is equal to 2.5 meters. And the ropes are modeled as light strings. That simply tells me that I do not need to worry about the mass or the weight of these ropes. Okay, the question then goes on to say, find the tension in the rope attached to the beam at A. It's asking us to find the value of TA. How do we do that? 
Well, we can use the fact that the beam, which is a rigid body, is in equilibrium to find it. A. Recalling the three conditions of any rigid body in equilibrium. First one is that there is zero net force in any direction. Second one is that there is zero acceleration of the rigid body. In this case, it is stationary. The third condition is that there is zero moment of this rigid body, i.e. there is zero turning effect collectively by all of these forces on this body. In order for us to find Ta, I want to take moments around C. Why is that the case? Why do I want C to be my axis of rotation? Well, by, turning mo by taking moments at C, I essentially eliminate the tension EC because there is zero perpendicular distance from this force, TC, to my axis of rotation, which is point B. By eliminating TC, I am left with only just these three forces that I need to consider moments for. So let's go ahead and do that. Here you can see the same force diagram we have seen before, and we're going to take moments at C, which is my axis of rotation. We can see that the weight of the particle has a clockwise turning effect or clockwise moment on the rod, and the weight of the rod has an anti-clockwise moment on the rod. Ta has a clockwise turning effect on the rod. You can see if I apply this force upwards, it's essentially going to turn this beam clockwise like this. Okay, because this rod is in equilibrium, we know that the clockwise and the anti-clockwise moments will cancel each other out. Let's take a look at the clockwise moment first. We know that is equal to the product of the magnitude of the force and the perpendicular distance to the axis of rotation, in our case is point C. That is equal to WP multiplied by the perpendicular distance to the axis rotation, that is equal to 0 0.5 given to us by the question, plus TA multiplied by the perpendicular distance to the axis rotation here. Recall that, how do we find these perpendicular distance? You can essentially draw a line from your axis of rotation C such that it is perpendicular to the direction of the force. And from there on, you get the length that you're looking for. So in this case, this is equal to 5 minus 0 0.5, right? Because we know that this is equal to 5, this part is equal to 0 0.5, you take that away from 5, that will give you this length that you're looking for. Okay, so that is the clockwise, clockwise moment. And that has to equal to the anti-clockwise moment, which is equal to weight of the rod, multiplied by the perpendicular distance, which is this part, that is equal to 2.5 minus 0 0.5. From there on, after the algebraic derivation, you can work out that my TA is equal to 43.6. Newton. As you can see, this is what we did here. Part two of the question says, find the tension in the rope attached to the beam at C. So here we're asked to find TC. This is exactly the same as part one, only that in this case, we want to take moment at point A because with point A being my axis of rotation, I don't need to consider the turning effect TA has on my rod because TA has zero perpendicular distance to the axis of rotation, meaning that it doesn't have a turning effect, turning effect of the rod at this point A. So here we need to consider the turning effect of these three points. And I can see that weight of the particle has the same clockwise turning effect. Weight of the rod in this case also has a clockwise turning effect. However, weight of my tension C has a anti-clockwise turning effect. From there on, it's the same as before. We're going to first sum up the clockwise moment, which is equal to WP multiplied by the perpendicular distance. In this case, it is the length of the rod, which is five, plus weight of the rod multiplied by the perpendicular distance. In this case, it's half of the rod, and that is equal to the anti-clockwise moment which is equal to Tc multiplied by 5 minus 0 0.5. And from there on, you can work out that Tc is equal to 789.4 Newton.
The question then goes on to say that particle P is removed and replaced by a particle Q of mass mkg at B. Given that the beam remains in equilibrium in a horizontal position, find the greatest possible value of m. Well, what the greatest possible value of m actually entails? For us to see that, let's go back to the basic and remove the particle altogether. When that is the case, the beam was simply suspended in a horizontal position by these two rope at point A at point C. And when that is the case, the question told us that the beam was in equilibrium and it was in a horizontal position, meaning that there is zero net force in any direction. So TA plus TC is equal to 25G. There is zero acceleration. The system was stationary, and there is zero moment, i.e. there is zero net turning effect by the three forces collectively on the beam. So using the last condition, we can actually find out what TA and TC are by taking moments at C and A, respectively. And now, in part A, part 1 and 2, we added a particle here, which has a weight 60 G. And we have seen that the tension at point A and C have to increase accordingly to hold this beam in equilibrium and in a horizontal position again. Right now, to have zero net force, TA plus TC needs to equal to 25G plus 60G. They have increased, and the system remains stationary because it's in equilibrium and in a horizontal position. And we have seen in part one and two, using the fact that the system has zero net for a turning effect or zero net moment, we can actually find out the value of TA and TC. Okay, so as we add more weight to the beam at point B, weight TA and TC need to increase accordingly, i.e. the reaction forces at both rope need to increase accordingly to hold the system in equilibrium in, and in a horizontal position. Now, let's consider a very extreme case where I add a very heavy weight to my point B. What is going to happen? Well, this beam was suspended from the ceiling by these two ropes. And when I add a very heavy weight to one end of this beam, what is going to happen is that it's going to flip over. It's going to pivot around my point C. So what this question is telling, is testing you, is the concept of tilting, which is when a rigid body is on the point of tilting about a pivot. And when this beam is about to tip over or is about to pivot around my point C clockwise, then the reaction force, i.e. TA, would equal to zero Newton. So the greatest possible value of M is such that the whole beam is just about to pivot over or just about to tilt, but it hasn't yet. So we are asked to find this value of Mg such that TA has just turned to zero Newton. We have seen that the greatest possible value of M when the beam remains in a horizontal equilibrium occurs at the point of tilting around the point C. When that is the case, the tension in the rope at point A is equal to zero. Now we can see this new force diagram. In order for us to work out the value of M, I can take moments at C because the tension in the rope at point C, TC, has no turning effect on the beam at this point. The clockwise moment exerted by the mass of the new particle Q and the anti-clockwise moment exerted by the rod will cancel each other out. By equating them, I was able to evaluate M, which is equal to 100 kg. Then the question asks us to find the greatest possible tension in the rope attached to the beam at C. This is a natural follow-on to the previous question. We have already seen that the maximum value of M such that the beam remains in a horizontal equilibrium is such that M is equal to 100 kg. So WQ is equal to 100 G. When that is the case, the beam is about to pivot around the point C, but it hasn't yet. So it's at the point of tilting and it's still in a horizontal equilibrium. When that is the case, tension in the rope at point A is equal to zero Newton. 
However, because the system is still in equilibrium, we know that there is zero net force in any direction. So looking at the force diagram in the vertical direction, I can see that Tc is equal to weight of the rod plus weight of my new particle Q. And that is equal to 25g plus 800g. And that is equal to 125g. From there on, you can plug in the value of g given to you by the exam board or by the formula book to evaluate that Tc is equal to 1,225 newtons. Let's now take a look at question three, which is taken from the Ad Excel sample paper three, question nine. It says that a uniform ladder AB of lens 2A and weight W has its end A on rough horizontal ground. There are two keywords to look out for. First one is a uniform ladder. It tells me that the weight of the ladder is exerted vertically downwards from its midpoint. So WL is equal to W, given to us by the question. And the distance from point A to the midpoint is A. Same goes with the distance from point B to this midpoint. And the fact that the end A is on a rough horizontal ground, I need to consider friction here. The coefficient of friction between the ladder and the ground is 1 over 4. The end B of the ladder is resting against a smooth vertical wall as shown below. Again, smooth is a keyword to look out for because I don't need to worry about friction when this ladder is moving up against the wall or slipping down against the wall. According to Newton's third law of motion, for any action, there's an equal but opposite reaction. In this case, since the ladder is resting on both the ground and the wall, both the ground and the wall would have a natural reaction exerted on the ladder. So the floor would exert a natural reaction. I'm going to call it R. Yeah, and R would always be perpendicular to the contact surface, which is the floor in this case. Similarly, the wall is going to exert a natural reaction force N, which is perpendicular to the surface or contact area that is the wall. Well, the difference between these two is such that because A is on the rough horizontal ground, I know that I need to consider friction. And friction F is equal to mu r, which is equal to 1 over 4r, as mu is given to us by the question. So bearing that in mind, let's move on with the question, which tells us a builder of weight 7w stands at the top of the ladder. So here, the weight of the builder is pointing vertically downwards, wb, which is equal to 7w. To stop the ladder from slipping, the builder's assistant applies a horizontal force of magnitude P to the ladder at A, towards the wall. The force acts in a direction which is perpendicular to the wall. So here we have the assistant applying a force of magnitude P towards the wall. And because the force acts in a direction which is perpendicular to the wall, we know that this is a right angle. It then says that the ladder rests in equilibrium in a vertical plane perpendicular to the wall, and it makes a angle alpha with the horizontal ground, where 10 alpha is equal to 5 over 2. So the key word to look out for here is equilibrium. The rest of the sentence simply means that we are working with a two-dimensional plane here. Right? The ladder can either slip down towards the ground, or it can move up against the wall. It's never going to move in and out of our screen. So it's a two-dimensional problem. And then the builder is modeled as a particle, and the ladder is modeled as a uniform rod. Here, this touches upon the first concept that we recapped, the difference between a particle and a uniform rod, which is a rigid body. Any force applied to a particle would not be able to turn it. There's no moment applied to a particle. However, when you're working with a rigid body, any force applied on it not only can move it, you can also turn it around. Okay, so taking a last look at our force diagram, are there any forces missing? Yes, we haven't put in the friction yet. Why is that the case? Well, I actually do not know in which direction the friction is applied to. We know that friction is always in the opposite direction of the motion or any forces that's about to move an object. In this case, without the assistant applying a horizontal force of P to the ladder, the ladder would no doubt slip down towards the ground. In that case, the motion will be horizontally to the left, 
and the friction will be horizontally to the right. It will look something like this. However, because the assistant is applying a force of P, it can be so large that it's at the point of moving the ladder and the builder on it up against the wall. When that is the case, the motion is horizontally to the right and the friction will be horizontally to the left. But we don't know which case it is right now. So now we have put everything the question told us into the force diagram. Let's go on and look at part one. Part one of the question says, show that the reaction of the wall on the ladder at B has magnitude 3W. You can see on the slides the same force diagram we have shown before. You will see that I put the friction as pointing horizontally to the left. That is not necessarily the case. I'm just putting it there for illustration. Okay, the question is asking us to show that n is equal to 3w. Well, how can I do that? Well, I'm going to use the fact that this ladder is in equilibrium. Recall that there are three conditions for any rigid body in equilibrium. First one is that there is zero net force in any direction. Second one is that there is zero acceleration, which is definitely the case because the ladder is stationary. Third one is that there is zero moment applied on this rigid body collectively by all of the forces here. Well, I'm asked to show that n is equal to 3w. And which condition I'm going to use? Do I want to use the first one when there is zero net force in any direction? Well, I'm not too keen. Why is that the case? Because there are so many unknown forces in this case, right? I don't know what R is, I don't know what P is, I don't even know the direction of my friction. I'm not super inclined there. And because the rigid body is stationary, it definitely doesn't have any acceleration. So what is left to me is really the third condition. I want to play around with that. I want to use the fact that this rigid body has zero net moment by all these forces. And from there, I'm hoping I can find out what my N is. In this case, the obvious choice is to take moment at point A. Why is that the case? Because at point A, none of these three unknown forces would have a turning effect or have any moment on my rigid body, which is the ladder, right? Because the distance, the perpendicular distance from these forces to the axis of rotation, which is simply point A in the two-dimensional plane, is zero. So take a moment at A, I need to consider the clockwise moment or the clockwise turning effect, the weight of the ladder, and the clockwise turning effect of the weight of the builder, and the anti-clockwise moment of this natural reaction exerted on the wall on the ladder. Adding the clockwise moment, I have W multiplied by the perpendicular distance to the axis of rotation, in this case is A. So I need to find the length of this line. How do I do that? Well, here I'm going to use trigonometry. The question essentially told us that we have a right angle triangle here. By the ladder AB, the floor and the wall. And also told us that 10 alpha is equal to 5 over 2. 5 over 2. And AB is equal to 2A. Using trigonometry and looking at this right angle triangle, because the weight of the ladder is always exerted vertically downwards, the distance from A to this midpoint is equal to A. So the length of this edge is equal to A cos alpha. So the clockwise moment exerted by the weight of the ladder is equal to W multiplied by A cos alpha. Similarly, the clockwise moment exerted by the weight of the builder is equal to 7w multiplied by this distance, 2a cos alpha. And the anti-clockwise moment exerted by the natural reaction of the wall to the ladder is equal to n multiplied by the perpendicular distance to the axis of rotation. The axis of rotation is here, a. How do I find this distance? Well, recall that to find this perpendicular distance, I essentially want to draw a line such that it is perpendicular to the direction of the force. The direction of the force is horizontally to the left here. 
I want to draw a line from this point A such that it is perpendicular to the direction of the force, and I want to find the length of this line, right? So this, the length of this edge is the same as this one. Again, I can use trigonometry in this right angle triangle to work out the length of this edge, which is equal to 2a multiplied by sine alpha. So the anti-clockwise moment is equal to n multiplied by 2a sine alpha. And these two must equate to each other in order to satisfy the third condition, zero net moment in this system. So from there on, I can work out that my n is equal to 3. W. Moving on to part two of the question. It says, find in terms of W, the range of possible values of P for which the latter remains in equilibrium. We have seen before, depending on how large or how small P is, the direction of friction is different. So we need to consider both cases. To start with, let's consider when P is large. When that is the case, the assistant is applying so much force horizontally to the right, the ladder might be at the point of moving up against the wall. In this case, the friction is horizontally to the left because it is always in the opposite direction of motion. You can see on the slides a force diagram. For the ladder to remain in equilibrium, we have seen the three conditions over and over again in today's video. First one is that it needs to have zero net force in any direction. Second is that it needs to have zero acceleration. Third one is that it needs to have zero net moment again in any direction. In part one, we have dealt with the zero net moment. However, in this part of the question, I'm going to focus on the zero net force in any direction. Why is that the case? Well, before we took moment at A, which means that we don't need to look at the turning effect of any of these three forces. However, here we're looking for possible values of P, which also depends on the frictions here. So I want to look at the net forces in the horizontal and vertical direction. The question has really been quite kind to us because all of the forces are in either of these directions. We don't need to resolve any forces. So to start with, let's look at the vertical direction. I can see that the weight of the builder the weight of the ladder are pointing vertically downwards when the natural reaction of the floor on the ladder is pointing vertically upwards. So in order for this ladder to be in equilibrium, R needs to equal to W plus 7W, which means that R is equal to 8W. And we know that the limiting value or the maximum value of friction depends on the natural reaction. F max or the limiting value of friction beyond which the object will start to move is equal to mu r. Mu is given to us by the question, which is equal to 1 over 4, so this is equal to 2w. The limiting value of friction is equal to 2w. And we know that any friction is always smaller than or equal to this limiting value. Bearing that in mind, let's look at the horizontal direction and all the forces there. You can see that E is horizontally to the right, friction is horizontally to the left, and the natural reaction exerted on the ladder by the wall is horizontally to the left as well. We have worked out in part one that N is equal to 3W. We can see that F plus 3W is equal to P. And F is equal to P minus 3w. Since f is always smaller than or equal to f max, this means that p minus 3w is smaller than or equal to f max, which is equal to 2w. From there on, we can work out that p is smaller than or equal to 5w, which means that intuitively, when the assistant is applying forces horizontally to the right, he has to apply a force smaller than or equal to 5w. If his force is any larger than that, this ladder will start to move horizontally to the right, or in other words, this ladder will start to move up against the wall. So that is the first scenario we considered, which is when the force P to the right is large and friction F is horizontally to the left. 
Let's now move on to scenario two, which is when the force P to the right is small. In this case, the latter has the propensity to slide to the left, i.e. the assistant is not applying enough forces, the latter constantly wants to slide down against the floor. In this case, the friction F is horizontally to the right. And the logic is the same as before. In order for the latter to remain in equilibrium, it needs to have zero net forces in both of the horizontal and the vertical direction. So let's consider the vertical direction first. R is still equal to 7W plus W, meaning that R is equal to 8W. That means F max is equal to mu R, which is equal to 2W. However, now in the horizontal direction, things are different because now N is equal to P plus F. Again, F is equal to N, which is equal to 3W minus P, and this is smaller than or equal to 2w. And we know that we can move p over to the other side and 2w over to this side. So 1w is smaller than or equal to p, as p is greater than or equal to 1w. Intuitively, it means that the assistant needs to apply at least 1w weight. Otherwise, the ladder with the builder on it will start to slide downwards towards the floor. So here we have found the upper and lower bound of P such that the latter will remain in equilibrium and we found the possible range of P is between 1 and 5 W. The question goes on to say that often in practice the builder's assistant will simply stand on the bottom of the ladder. Explain briefly how this helps to stop the ladder from slipping. Well let's go back to the force diagram. We have a rough ground and a smooth wall. The ladder is point A resting on the ground and point B on the wall. As its weight vertically downwards here, builder's weight is here. We have the natural reaction from the floor and the natural reaction from the wall. Now the builder's assistant is no longer applying this horizontal force to the right as we or instead, the assistant is standing on the ladder, applying his or her weight vertically downwards here. In this case, for the ladder to remain in equilibrium, we need to have zero net forces in any given direction. Same as before, let's consider the vertical case. R needs to equal to WL plus WB plus WA. This weight of assistant is something new. In order for the ladder to be in equilibrium, the natural reaction exerted on the ladder by the floor R also increases. And when R increases, the maximum or limiting value of friction, which is equal to mu R, also increases. So now there is more friction on the ground, meaning that it is harder for the ladder to slide downwards, hence stopping the ladder from slipping. So by standing at A, the assistant in turn increases the normal reaction R by his or her own weight, which then in turn increases the limiting value of friction. Since friction is larger, the propensity of the ladder to slide reduces. So that concludes our video today on the past paper Q&A on moments. Well done. We hope you find it useful, and if you haven't done so already, definitely subscribe to our channel so you can notify next time we'll put out a tutorial video. Thank you for watching and see you next in class.